Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Tuesday, August 13th. Lots of great um, and and important life issues Mm -hmm. on deck today. Joining us now by phone, Dr. Michelle Cretella, Executive Director of the American College of Pediatricians. Dr. Cretella, thanks for joining us on the Coffee Hour. Thanks for the invitation. It's great to be here. Uh, A little background on the American College of Pediatricians for us before we get into uh, some of the the recent issues um, regarding uh, infants surviving abortion. Just to paint a picture for us, um, uh, for our listeners, about the American College of Pediatricians. Sure, certainly. Um, The American College of Pediatricians is the pro-life alternative to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, We are a Um, a national organization of pro-life pediatricians numbering approximately 600 members. Um, We separated from the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2002. Um, uh, We also differ from the American Academy of Pediatrics in that we um, support uh, primary prevention uh, in terms of um, sex education and uh, parent rights, um, uh, essentially were thought of and described as the conservative alternative to the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, and mm-hmm. that, that's probably the easiest way to think of us. And, and great partners with the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians mm-hmm. and Gynecologists Ameri- as well. Yes, we, par- we have partnered for many years now with the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs, uh, both in putting out, uh, putting forth um, continuing medical education conferences, and um, also in numerous uh, joint letters um, promoting um, pro-life legislation and initiatives. It's nice to know that we have both doctors, pro-life doctors who who care for and deliver babies, and then pro-life doctors right. <laughs> who care for those babies as they grow up as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, exactly. Getting to the the the, the more the uh, timely issue of um, uh, recent statements and and information coming out regarding infants surviving abortion. What are the important terms for us to know as we uh, see these topics coming up in in mainstream media and in uh, in other news outlets as well? What are the important terms for us to know about this? Right. Well, I, what we are continually um, seeing is that um, the Democrats um, in in the House are repeatedly shooting down the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Act. Um, and uh, so we frequently see, oh, you know, hey, Democrats block ban on infanticide. So that's so the the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Act um, in the uh, in the House and the Senate, uh, well, it passed the Republicans uh, controlled, um, but the Democrats continuing to continue to block. What and that's what makes these um, current standing um, regulations known as MTALA, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act and the Born Alive Infant Protection Act of 2002, even more important. Um, The Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, together with the Born Alive Infant Protection Act of 2002, um, apply not only to premature babies and normal babies who deliver. In other words, as soon as a baby is is born present in, in a hospital, um, regardless of circumstances, that baby is a patient presenting for care. And under those federal laws, MTALA and Born Alive Infant Protection Act of 2002, even if the baby is born alive after an abortion, he or she is still under those federal laws considered a patient deserving of evaluation and care. So when the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services came out and reissued this understanding and interpretation of these um, longstanding laws, that, that's what made it so, that's what makes it so important. It's calling attention to the fact that, hey, even under current federal law, we should be treating 
all infants, all newborns, those at term, those who are premature, including those who are born as a result of a failed abortion. What is the significance of that of that reissuing? Since these these documents are already um, already out there, um, what what is that significance of of reissuing this guidance um, coming from the Department of Health and Human Services? Basically, it's a wake up call to uh, um, hospital administrations and physicians to hey take <laughs> you're you're being put on notice. Um, and um, the reason this reissuing came about um, was actually a direct result of actions taken by the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs and the American College of Pediatricians. Um, one of the board members of the Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs um, produced evidence that Premature babies were not even being evaluated for resuscitation at some hospitals. Mm. So even separate from the abortion issue, um, this board member found hard evidence that hospitals were in violation of MTALA and the Born Alive Infant Protection Act. Together, our organizations presented this evidence to CMS and Department of HHS. Um, some meetings were, were in-person meetings were had as well, which led to this reissuing of the guidance uh, and calling attention to the fact that these federal protections exist. And I, I, as you're <laughs> suggesting, of course, mm-hmm. hospitals, what's to prevent hospitals or doctors from ignoring? Well, once you make it public, you know, public knowledge, now patients, Pregnant women have a right to know. They they know that um, some hospitals have been ignoring this law. So, um, you could say it empowers the patient to go to their doctors and, and call for transparency. Um, what will happen if I go into labor early? Um, how you know what is your hospital's policy? in treating premature infants. Um, we have just about two minutes left. Uh, and, and so I think I understand what these, these documents accomplish. Is there anything that they do not accomplish or anything that's left unaddressed uh, in the, the reissuing of um, these guidelines? Um, the documents are limited in that they can't address the fact that there is a gray zone in terms of um, resuscitating premature babies between, let's say, between 20 weeks and and 24 weeks. Um, There are treatments in resuscitation that could be considered um, extraordinary measures. So it's not, you know, there's no cookbook or cut and dry path to necessarily follow in every um, scenario. So the one piece that uh, we really need more of from hospitals and doctors is transparency in terms of what are our limitations when confronted with babies at, you know, between that 20, 22, 24 weeks ge- uh, gestation. What is our policy? Patients, women uh, have a right to know. Um, so we, we need a push for transparency and um and I think as uh, at the grassroots level, um, just spreading the word that, look, regardless of the conditions of a, ch- of, of a child's birth, be it at term, preterm, or the result of a failed abortion, this child is recognized in, under current federal law as a patient in the hospital deserving of care. Dr. Michelle Cortella, Executive Director of the American College of Pediatricians. Thank you for joining us on the Coffee Hour this morning. Oh, thanks so much for having me. You have a great day. Thank you. You too.
Well, coming up tomorrow, back to school. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to admit, it's first day <laughs> of kindergarten for my son. So, oh boy. Yeah. So <laughs> we're going to talk with uh, some school folks today with uh, Dr. Becky Schmidt this afternoon. Mm-hmm. So we can pre- prepare that for tomorrow so you don't have to listen to me. Uh, <laughs> Sniffle. Ball. Yeah. So we'll share that with you tomorrow morning. Um, back to school topics and take a look at the chapel talks for Lutheran schools for this year. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support the Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere.